Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Things We Said Today, uh, a podcast in which we discuss all things Beatle, both uh, their history and also what's currently in the news, and we'll be doing uh, quite a bit of that uh, in this session. I'm Al Sussman from Beatle Fan Magazine, and I'm joined by my cohorts, or most of them, Ken Michaels, who's uh, many of you know as the, as the host of a uh, syndicated Beatles music show called Every Little Thing. Hey, Ken, how are you? I'm doing great, Al. Hi, everybody. Steve Marinucci writes uh, Beatle, the Beatles Examiner column, as well as a number of other columns for examiner.com. Hi, Steve. Hi, Al. Hello, everyone. Uh, our, uh, our resident musicologist, Alan Cozen, who's also uh, an esteemed member of the, uh, the Beatle fan family, um, he's in the process of transitioning to New England. So uh, right now he's very much involved with that, so he unfortunately wasn't able to, uh, to join us for this session. But we do have our returning champion from, uh, from WFUV in, uh, in New York, uh, our uh, recurring guest panelist, uh, Darren DeVivo. Hey, Darren. Hey, what's up, Al? Hey, everybody. How you doing, Ken and, uh, and Steve? And what I think first, uh, first on the agenda... Uh, is since it occurred only a uh, weekend before last, uh, as we're taping, uh, was the, the induction ceremonies in Cleveland for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the induction of Ringo Starr as a, um, well, as a, a solo artist, but uh, I guess more and more technically as a, uh, as an influential drummer. And for, before we get into that discussion, <laughs> Though uh, I believe both Ken and Steve have uh, some some detail and some other uh, uh, anecdotes about what went on at the uh, at the ceremonies. Ken, let's well, start. you want okay. Well, most of what I know is based of based on what I've seen online, and and much of that comes from Steve's writings mm-hmm. in, in Beatles Examiner that uh, Paul McCartney did the induction for Ringo, and um, his speech was was really um, very heartfelt. At least I think so, anyway. And a bit funny. It was very nostalgic. It was mainly talking about uh, the early years for Ringo, what a rough life he had, and how he eventually joined the Beatles. And the Beatles became the Beatles once Ringo joined. He got a lot of cheers for a lot of the things that he was saying. And um, I think his speech was, was great, although I kind of wish that there was some mention about his solo career somewhere in the speech. It was just mainly talking about you know, the early years with Ringo. And um, and I also got to see online the performances with Ringo doing the four songs that he did. And I think the performances were fantastic. Um, he did Boys with Green Day backing him up, which I think sounded phenomenal. And he also did It Don't Come Easy with Joe Walsh joining in. And then with Paul McCartney for the last two numbers and everybody else who was inducted or were presenters, they... they uh, they went on stage and um, they did With a Little Help from My Friends and I Want to Be Your Man. And I thought the performances were wonderful. From what I understand, based on what Steve has written from his reporter, um, there was a film that was shown about Ringo uh, and his uh, influence as a drummer. I don't really, I can't really comment about the film since I haven't seen it. But I don't know, you know, if it was something that spanned his entire career, if it was just strictly his work as a drummer. But um, for one thing, I'm just really thrilled that he's in because, um, you know, if you if you follow the solo careers uh, of the Beatles and when they each got in, in my personal opinion, and we can even debate this if you want, they all should have gone in one year after another. There shouldn't have been these long gaps in between. And uh, when you think that John Lennon was inducted in 1994, Paul McCartney had to wait five years before he got in. And then five years for George after that, and that was only after he passed away. And then another, uh, that would be 11 years for Ringo. It really is kind of shameful, in my opinion, because they all should have gotten in early on when they were first eligible. And, um, you know, we could talk about this. There's so many points I'd like to make about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but that Mm. can go off on a lot of tangents, (laughs) as you know. And and, and, and that may happen. (laughs) As a matter of fact, the, matter the of thing f- about mm-hmm. the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is one of those topics where 
every time there's a thread on Facebook about it, I say to myself, I'm not going to read this. And then it develops <laughs> into 200 people commenting, and I'm still reading it anyway. Mm -hmm. I promise myself I'm not going to get involved in it, and then I do. Mm -hmm. Because people's feelings about music are pretty passionate. Sure. And who should get in and who's in there that shouldn't be in there. You can go on for hours on that topic. So, um, you know, those are my feelings in general. I, like I said, I'm thrilled to pieces that Ringo finally got in. It's long overdue. Uh, I wish I can comment as an observer, having been there, but everything is basically what I've read online mainly from Steve's work, and um, and the videos, too, which I'm glad were posted online, too, mm -hmm. for those four songs. Mm -hmm. So that's what I have to say. Yeah. Now, the, the the ceremonies themselves, which in the past have almost almost every year, they were, well, I mean, they began basically as just a dinner at the Waldorf Astoria. And mm. this year they were moved to a large arena in Cleveland. Uh, oddly enough, the same arena at which at which the Beatles played uh, in in 1964 and 60 well in 1964. But Steve, maybe you know, maybe you can kind of fill in the blanks uh, on this. You know, why was you know first of all why why were the ceremonies held in, in an arena and uh, and when, what can you tell us about some of the, some of the other detail that went on that night? Well, I, I, honestly, I don't know about the arena part. They may very well have done that, you know, because of the Beatle history. It seemed like they did a little bit of, um, of uh, you know, of, ref of uh, respect for the Beatles in oh. there, being that Ringo was, you know, one of the honorees. Ken talked about Paul's speech. I thought Ringo's speech was very war warm and uh, actually a lot more than usual. I mean, he was really, he seemed mm. really touched by the whole event, and that that was really kind of, uh, I thought that was really kind of interesting. I mean, there was, you know, the whole issue about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I saw a, co a comment this morning on Facebook that really was kind of, that really stuck out at me. It said, Patty Scialfa is in the Hall of Fame, and Mickey Dolenz is not. And I think that's, I think, you know, I, I do think that's, pretty bad um i mean you could get into we could get into the and we probably will the whole political bull that, uh -huh. that envelops the, the rock and roll hall of fame and why people like yes and the uh, yes especially is a great example of somebody that should be in there that isn't yeah. um and the moody and the moody blues there's right. that's well let's let's that, let's save that for uh all right. for all right. uh, a few minutes but, okay. about, as far as as far as the as far as the the ceremony itself goes ringo's speech was was uh, you know he talked about his history and, as a performer and and you know people were saying he didn't mention his solo career well that's not why he got he got inducted he got inducted as a musician and I you know so we can go on about that but anyway that's that's basically save, save that debate save that, save debate, that debate for yes. later instead of just letting it rest at that yeah. right. okay all right all right all right yeah, I, we'll, I, we'll I, save we'll save both of those debates. Okay. In fact, for uh, for a few minutes from now, um, one thing I wanted to uh, ask about was that the the it, it was one of those kind of Beatles family reunions. Right. Yeah. There was everybody was there. I mean, Nancy was there, Olivia was there, Yoko was there, the whole kit and caboodle. Everybody. Uh, of course, Barbara was there. You know, her, uh, her sister was there. I mean, everybody. The, they everybody showed up. Uh, uh, Danny was there. I, I don't remember. I remember if I saw a picture of Danny, but Danny was there. In fact, there was there was one picture, I guess, kind of a semi-official picture that was taken at the table with uh, with Nancy and Olivia and Barbara and, and Barbara and mm -hmm. her sister Marjorie, uh, and of course the the know nothings on uh, in social media, of course, had to chime in with you know oh. Where was Yoko? Uh, yeah. I guess I guess those, those women wouldn't want her sitting at a table with them. You know these idiots. Yeah, <sighs> Yoko, Yoko was indeed there, and also at the table, I guess for a while was Jerry Lee Lewis, who is a yes big hero of mine. And I was that was uh, he's getting he's really starting to look bad. And I yeah, really, well he's I'm got really some years on. To, yeah, and I'm really, I'm really. You know, every time I see a picture of him or hear him lately, I kind of go, "Ooh, God!" I can, you know, I'm waiting for the bad news. But uh, it was good to see Jerry Lee there. Um, 
very good to see Jerry Lee. So. Steve, you mentioned you mentioned that Danny was there, but I didn't hear about any of the other Beatles kids being there. I didn't either. Danny was the, I, as far as I know, Danny was the only one I heard that was there. Were well, those kids there? I don't know. I'd, I would guess that they were, but uh, the people that did a lot of sent me a lot of the information would have noticed if they were there. Mm-hmm. They would have noticed, and they did not. Sent, they did not tell me. I could probably check into that. It's a little late now, but I mean, uh, and find out for the future. But uh, well, I, someone I, someone did mention the fact that he that Ringo in his speech didn't mention any of his kids, mm-hmm. including well, including mm. Zach. Yeah, I I don't know. I don't know what that you know. Yeah, I don't know what what the deal is. I would would have thought they they. Of course, then been. again, he apparently in the the original speech. Uh, because he did come back and made a few other remarks, uh, but in the, in the first speech, he didn't even mention Barbara. <laughs> and, right. And, and, and yeah, right and there, he, so. that's right. That's right. And he came back and said, "Oops, I didn't mention Barbara." Right. So yeah, he got. Uh, he definitely, you know, he had to he had to cure that one, or God knows what would have happened. But uh, yeah. anyway, there we go. Actually, uh, I was a bit amazed at how lengthy. Ringo's speech was mm-hmm. when I read the transcript. Mm-hmm. He had quite a lot to say there, so uh, I was very impressed with that. Yeah, right. In right. fact, there was that funny moment where, at one point, Paul kind of tapped his watch, and Ringo said, "No, no, no, I've got <laughs> people are up here is going blah blah blah. And I've got stories to tell." <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So yeah, that was kind of that was kind of funny. Now, Darren. Got to take the yes, sir. Got to take the choke chain off of you, because <laughs> you were uh, mentioning uh, mentioning a little bit earlier that um, you uh, have some problems with the fact that that in effect uh, Ringo was given an award that used to be simply a sideman award, right? And, and I guess I guess here is where we open up at least one of the debates. Yes, uh, that we're hold, holding off on opening. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm in total agreement with Ken and didn't even, it, I don't even think it occurred to me, uh, how much time went by before Paul, uh, went in and then George went in. And I still feel, although I, 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 I know some people that don't agree with me here, I still feel that Wings should go in as a band. But anyway, the fact that Ringo, who I've felt for years should have been inducted was finally, I'm, I'm happy he's in, don't get me wrong, but, the fact that he did not really get the ultimate, for lack of a better way of putting it, prize or mm-hmm. honor would be a better way of putting it, of being inducted into the hall as a performer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I felt like when I heard that he was just going in as an influential musician, mm-hmm. my immediate response was, gee, thanks for the consolation prize. You know, if I were Ringo, I would have said, you know what, thanks for nothing. Um, because, and I, and I have some, you know, as we go along, some numbers to share about the commercial success that Ringo enjoyed as a solo artist. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like it holds its own against some of the commercial fortunes of some of the people who went in this year Mm -hmm. and, uh, if not surpasses it, Mm -hmm. uh, couple that with the influence that he had and Ringo should be in as a performer. Mm -hmm. Uh, so my immediate reaction was that Ringo was getting a consolation prize. Uh, I heard Lennon, or, you know, as time went by, as the ceremony got closer and people were just saying Ringo's getting inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I was thinking that perhaps my mind was changing a bit because there's no more asterisk. I felt like there was an asterisk next, next mm-hmm. to it. I feel like there is now. now. Now that it's been, now that it happened and we saw the categories, and I really looked closely at what was going on that night. That um, it's a shame that he's just not in as a performer because he deserves it. Well, Darren, Darren, I think maybe you should use the word artist instead of performer. No, I'm thinking. I'm I'm trying to remember what I saw on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame website. Uh, the way they listed the candidates and the category that they were going in as. I know that Lou Reed they listed as performer. Right. Okay, and. That's why I'm saying Ringo should have gone in at the highest level, which I'm assuming would be performer. Because he's got the influence, 
but his commercial fortunes, while concentrated to the 1970s, is nothing to sneeze at. Mm-hmm. Right. You know. Yeah. So that's why I'm using the performer word. It is kind of revealing the fact that that, you know, that 15 minute uh, film that was shown was almost exclusively about Ringo as a drummer mm-hmm. and really not, you know, nothing about him as a, a performer, as an well, artist. Remember, he, he was hmm. inducted the, uh, the way it was announced, and I'm looking at the site anyway. Mm-hmm. But the way it was announced, he was inducted in the category. He was given the award for musical excellence. Right. That was, that was what he was given. And it was right. funny to see some of the comments online from people saying, how come he didn't mention his solo career? You know, like, and, and you know, you had to remind people that that's not what he was inducted for. Yeah. Was that, but yet, was, I, I have quotes here. I have quotes here from Paul, Yoko, and Joe Walsh all saying he's getting in for his solo career. They're all saying it. So that's got to carry some weight to it. Now, I know there's there's someone that I'm friends with in the industry who probably wouldn't want his name mentioned mm-hmm. here, who recently interviewed Paul, and Paul privately said to him, he's getting in for his solo work. So Paul must know something on the inside of what he's getting in for. It's just that the way it was presented during this award ceremony, you know, it was more about him as a drummer. I have a feeling that uh, perhaps because of the fact that it's taken so long, I have a feeling that Paul may have maybe, um, you know, bent a couple of uh, of uh, people's elbows. He did. To, to, he did. Uh, yeah. He sure I, did. I wrote, I wrote that, I wrote that uh, a few months ago. I was told by a, a source that that was, that, that that was indeed the case, mm-hmm. that Paul had something to do with it. But I think, getting back to the to the award itself, I think they did that because, they knew that if they had inducted him as a solo performer, it would have raised a lot more. It would have it would have put a lot more negative buzz on the whole thing. Because there were, okay. There, there would be, I'm, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me, okay. let me finish. Okay. Because there would have been a lot of people, and especially on social media, that would have complained about the fact that he was given as a solo career, and they would have said, "No, he doesn't deserve it." Okay. Whereas, first of all. Too much emphasis is being put on what these idiots on social media have to say. Who gives a rat's fanny what these know-nothing morons have to say on social media? You know, I, it would have been I, I, to limit it to social media is wrong. I think it would have been you, you would have seen you would have seen it. You know, in the you would have seen writers come out with that. Well, Darren, Darren just mentioned that he has some stats. I mm. took notes. Okay, let's hear. I it. have notes I've prepared here. Oh, uh, hey. <laughs> um, we have one. We have one professional amongst the four of us. <laughs> <laughs> Ringo had a, uh, which we all know this uh, as hardcore Beatle fans and uh, Beatle experts, uh, but it's easy to forget that. Ringo had a concentrated period of commercial success, which really rivaled a similar period of time. Let me try to make sense here. What, this, this, this period of success that Ringo had rivaled really anything that George, John, and even to some extent Paul enjoyed. I'm talking no, strictly I, now commercially. Right. Okay. I'm not, I'm Ringo. Not arguing with that. Go ahead. But go ahead. Okay. Uh, ignoring Ringo's first U.S. single, which was Buku's of Blues, uh, starting with a Don't Come Easy right. in 71, which went to number four on the charts on Billboard in the United States. A right. Don't Come Easy started a run of seven consecutive top ten hit. A Don't Come Easy, Back Off Boogaloo, Photograph, which was a number one, You're 16, which was a number one, Oh My My, Only You, and No No Song were all top ten hits, consecutive releases. All right, and that string goes from seven top ten hits to nine straight top forty hits. Uh, if you include After No No Song, Good Night Vienna reaching number thirty one, and A Dose of Rock and Roll reaching twenty six. Right. That's Ringo's. Uh, that's um, uh, nine consecutive top forty hit singles. 
commercial success that Lou Reed did not have, Mm -hmm. that Joan Jett and the Blackhearts did not have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, speaking strictly Beatles, John did not enjoy a commercial run like that. Neither did George. Mm -hmm. McCartney... Probably, I didn't want to get into the picking no, no. details. Well, it took it, t- but it took a no. while for him to get it, on it, that kind of a run. And but I'll give you even a, even more of a contrast. There are other performers in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, well, not to speak ill of the recently departed, but Percy Sledge is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for one record. When right. a man loves a woman is the only hit record he ever had. The only pop right. hit record he ever had. Right. Del Shannon is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, basically based on three records on Runaway, Hats Off to Larry, and Little Town Flirt, because he had a couple of minor hits in 60, 64, 65, but, uh, but those three, you know, those were his three main hits. The Ronettes are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, besides the Phil Spector connection. They're basically in there for, really, you're talking about three records. You're really talking about Be My Baby, Baby I Love You, and Walking in the Rain. Because Do I Love You, the best part of breaking up, I can hear music, none of them were really major hits. So that run that Ringo had in the early 70s really eclipses a number of acts who are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So right. he so, 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 really, so based on that really, he should be in as a performer. The um the, the the songs that I mentioned starting with his set well his his uh his second US single at Don't Come Easy right. through A Dose of Rock and Roll in 76 uh that is as I mentioned nine consecutive singles all nine won top 40 the first seven of those nine were top 10 hits and there were two number ones in there if you really want to stretch it out and include buku of blues and hey baby the first 11 songs to be released as singles of ringo's solo career in the united states all 11 of them showed up on the charts and he has a total of 10 top 40 hits under his belt total for his career now i know that sales aren't everything Mm-hmm. But when you take that and couple that with the reason he went in as an influential musician, right. I think you're looking at somebody that deserves to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a solo artist, period. Mm-hmm. And if you want to I really stretch it to uh, you know, his full chart career, as late as 1981, he had a top 40 single with Wreck My Brain. That's right. But the, but the yep. thing is that if you try to logically – piece this together, you're going to end up screwed because there is no logic to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Right. Well, you're right. It's all, that's it's true. all freaking politics. And that's the problem. Well, you know? that's, but that's you why. Would, you would think that, yeah, politics, you, you, you're totally right. But when it comes to a Beatle, any Beatle, politics shouldn't be at play here. And I agree, I agree with you completely. I agree. But again, we're talking about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and I don't want to even, you know, I could I could go on a real rant and talk about, you know, the guy that's ahead of it and all that. I'm not no, going to do I'm that. I'm just about to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I mean, there's so many mistakes, you know, in there. Uh, it's it's just, I mean, the the people that aren't in that should be, the I mean, and the people that are getting excluded, you know, aced out because you know they, uh, you know, it's it's just crazy. And and so, you know, I'm glad Ringo is here. Let know. me ask you guys. If you, you know, if somebody walked up to you on the street and said, is Harry Nilsson in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? What would you say? I would say he isn't, he but is. he deserves to be. Right. Right. Okay. I, for some reason, I keep forgetting that fact. But this morning, while I was um, taping, we're taping this on the day that uh, tickets for Paul McCartney's concert at Philadelphia went on sale. While I was uh, trying to get tickets, I happened to, on a an article that actually is a year old that ran in of all places Rolling Stone, the publication headed by the man who for whom the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's nominating and election process seems to be very much a plaything, Jan Wenner, the publisher of Rolling Stone, 
there was a list of, I think, 22 acts who, at a year ago, uh, because Joan Jett was in that list, were not, uh, not yet in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And Harry Nelson was on that list. And remind me, because I keep, I keep thinking he's in. And the, the fact that he's not in is absolutely, is, and, you know, it, it, there's a Beatle, you know, it's obviously a Beatle connection there. So that's why I'm, I'm bringing it up. But the, the fact that Harry Nelson is not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is very nearly criminal. It's mm-hmm. absolutely well, ridiculous. Can I and add my, 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 my three cents in? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many ways you can go with this conversation. And so many times I've, I've talked about this with my family and, and music fans. For one thing, I totally agree on with what all of you are saying. Steve's point of view, Darren's point of view, if you've had a sizable number of hits, you should be in. But by the same token, there are artists in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame who have had less hits who are in, <laughs> like you just said, Al. There are people who have had more hits than Ringo. A band like Chicago, right. they're not in. Chicago has you know, never even been nominated, let alone okay. selected. They've right. never even been nominated. And, and many is the time, and I said this with Steve when we were doing our show together, that both progressive rock and heavy metal have been snubbed. Yes. With mm-hmm. the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Very much. So. Uh, certainly Genesis deserves to be in, mm-hmm. but how could Yes not be in? Right. You know, right. especially right. their career started pretty much the same time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But one thing that's very important to bring up here, and this is where everybody can debate, we all have our own criteria as to why sh- why certain artists should be in. What if you're an artist that had one hit record? But you are a big influence. What if you're someone like Buddy Holly, who only had a few singles anyway? He died too young. But you know he had a huge influence. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he deserves to be in. At Buddy the same Holly time, Buddy Holly is in. Well, of course. I'm saying he yeah. is in. Sure. Okay, but you, you can't just go strictly by how many hits you have. No. Now, I remember as, as someone who's a big chart buff here, a guy who listened to Casey Kasem every single week <laughs> and wrote down the top 40 every single week that before we had the, the top female hit makers of the Madonnas and Linda Ronstadt, right. there was someone named Connie Francis. Yep. Mm-hmm. Connie Francis had more singles and hits than any other female artist up until like the mid-70s. Mm-hmm. Right. And she's not in. Right. right. You know, okay. and I, I, I was looking over the list here and... And I would even make a case for Brian Wilson, even though the Beach Boys are in. I think Brian Wilson deserves to be in. But that's, you know, you could, you can but go. Um, I personally believe that if you have a lot of hits, you should be in. But there are plenty of artists who have had more than Ringo that are not in. Right. So, and by, and by the same token, the idea that Ringo gets in the same year as Green Day, hello? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I see. Right. Ringo's solo career started in 1970. When did Green Day start? You have to have 25 years of, of making records to be eligible. Okay. But you're telling that that's a slap in the face to itself. Oh, yeah. In fact, I mean, I'm not saying Green Day doesn't deserve it, but why should he get in the same year as 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 Green Day and Joan Jett? Right. Wait your turn. It makes no sense. Now, Green, <laughs> yeah, Day, yeah. I, Green Day's first album came out 25 years ago. Like, I think it was 25 right. years ago last week. So they made it by, you know, a week. And also, yeah. not to not to take away anything from Ringo, you mentioned the Moody Blues. I always bring up the Moody Absolutely. Blues. Absolutely. They they deserve to get in before Ringo, mm-hmm. or for that matter, any of the solo Beatles. Sure. You know, their their career started '64 around '64 mm-hmm. when they were a blues band. So mm-hmm. you know, it really should go chronologically. In the very beginning of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it was exciting, right? Because you got all these '50s artists in there that really deserved it, mm-hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Sure. But but then it started to really thin out, and then you started to have a lot of inductees that stretched different decades, where it didn't really make sense why someone from the 80s got in before someone from the 60s got in. So about, I don't understand that. You know? And how about when you start mixing genres, uh, which I have no problem with, uh, and I don't have an issue with Madonna's in, right, guys? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, hey. good. Double check. I don't really have an issue uh, with Madonna being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because I think that she has rose above categories. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when you start seeing certain, uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, rap or, or, or hip, artists, hip hop, uh, hip hop artists and rap artists come to mind going in before Ringo 
and those mm. bands that we've just mentioned. Chicago has always been at the top of my mm-hmm. list of the biggest snub period of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And even mm-hmm. even if you don't necessarily uh, uh, agree, like even a band like Kiss, I felt should have been in so long ago. Think mm-hmm. what you want mm. to think about Kiss, but their impact was massive coupled with the fact that they sold a pretty good share of records in the 70s, and the fact that they didn't get in right away is, uh, is it was sort of ridiculous. It gets to the point where after a while you throw your hands up and you're like, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to me is a really good, is, is a really great museum to visit, and that's all it is, and mm-hmm. it's a special on HBO once a year to watch for the performances. Right. Somebody, somebody else that should be in, the Shangri-Las. Well, the Shangri-Las are again; they're kind of on that on that border um, because oh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't much understand. like much like the Ronettes, they really did not have a lot of hits. And how much influence they had is, you know, is debatable. Oh, I think they had a ton of influence. Mary, what? Mary Weiss? Mary? Are they all those all those that, those girls? I, I shouldn't call them girls, but. They they were very much an influence. They they influenced guys, that's for sure. <laughs> but but they were no, they were very they were very much you know the uh, style, you know very much uh, very influential on the style back in the sixties and and uh, well, I, I, well, think I mean their 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 hit career was only about it was less than two years. You know you're really talking, you know remember walking in the sand, leader of the pack. Uh, give them a great big kiss out in the streets, and I can never go home anymore. And by the end of '65, they were done. As far when as you start opening up the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to bands like Green Day, who were in on the first year of their eligibility, yeah, that's ridiculous. Right. Um, I think you, the, the the debate then starts. You can make. I mean, that really makes the argument for the Shangri Las more of a. Well, yeah. You know, these just with those two songs. The major impact that they had, if you're going to put Green Day in the first year they're eligible, you know, then, you know, let's really open up the floodgates although, if we should go although, in. Well, you know, you know, kind of taking it from their, uh, their aspect, one could say that, uh, you know, the, the, there was never a Broadway show, uh, based on music, based on the hits of the Shangri-Las. And, you know, the, uh, Green Day was really kind of in the vanguard of the first wave of alternative rock in the early in the early 90s in the early mm-hmm. and mid 90s and continued to have you know a good amount of you know certainly of influence and success through into the new century with American Idiot both the album and the Broadway show they belong sure. in but the fact that they went in so fast. That's, yeah, that's what yeah. I, I have a little problem with is that they, that, you know, they should have at least had to wait a year or two before they went in. And, you know, you mentioned Kiss before and one could say, well, you know, if they're going in mainly because of their abilities to as a spectacle and, and all and their videos and all, uh, how come the monkeys aren't in? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, huh? there you go. Yeah, it's right. Todd Rundgren's but not you in. Know, Todd Rundgren yeah. is another one. I, I couldn't believe that when I heard yeah. the Todd that's Rundgren the, is not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. That's that's mind-boggling. That's that's absolutely mind-boggling. But again, Al, mm-hmm. we keep bringing up this issue of hits. I mean, Todd Rundgren, to me, is one of the most brilliant artists. I'm a big fan of his. If you think about hits and what the average person knows outside of his... Oh, yeah, his, it's just... Uh, Steady fan. He he has hello, it's me, and I saw, I saw the light, the light and it. and bang the drum all day, yeah. which really you know but became see, a big album cut. But I, and I'm not debating. There's a lot of other great songs he's done. Oh yeah, and don't get me wrong. Really, but uh, as far as the average person, what they know from him, right? You know, outside of his real strong fans, they only know a few songs from him. Oh yeah, but I, uh, by the time that he really came to the fore, there was more. You know, in uh, the uh, the criteria, say, for being elected to something like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was more than just hit records. Right. Uh, and that included influence, and certainly, certainly as a 
you know, as a, as a recording artist and as a producer and with Utopia and all, Todd Rundgren has had a tremendous influence. Mm-hmm. So I think he's an artist who certainly deserves to be in. You know, I've let me s- ask you guys one question here. Okay. I'm going to throw one act from the sixties that had a lot of hits who are not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Right. And you tell me if you think they deserve it, because if you do, it's really strictly because of the hits. Mm-hmm. All right? Herman's Hermits. They actually should be in. because. And why do you think so? Because of the fact, because it's a different, you know, you, you, when you're talking the 60s as opposed to the 70s and 80s and beyond, you're talking a time when your barometer was having hit records. And Herman's Hermits from the end of 64 to about the beginning of 68 had a ton of hits. He, they sure and did. And they, yeah. Yes, they, they did. Uh, they certainly, I mean, if, if you figure if the Hollies are in, that they should, then Herman's Hermits should be in. They had 18 top 40 hits yeah. right between those. Between oh, yeah. Those they years. should absolutely be in. And, and again, they've never, they've never even been nominated. Right. But what's what's more important, having hits or being an influence? And oh. here's here's a very difficult question to answer. If you've already had a lot of hits, does that mean that you are an influence anyway? Because a lot of people have bought your records. You know, you could be an artist that had a ton of hits. And this is one argument that I get with certain people. Now, if you're talking about someone like Connie Francis, who I mentioned before, mm-hmm. one artist who had so many hits as a female singer is Olivia Newton-John. Sure. And she's not in. Right. Now, should we assume that since since she had a lot of hits, that she's an influence? I would say Linda Ronstadt was an influence. Oh, I don't know if I don't know if Olivia was, but should we assume if you've had a lot of commercial success that you therefore have to be somewhat influential by the very nature that you've sold a lot of records? I think to an extent, yeah. Uh, cause I, I think, cause I think you can, I think you can see the influence of Olivia Newton John, uh, and certainly Linda Ronstadt on a lot of the country female vocalists of the, uh, of the eighties, especially the nineties, the Pam Tillises, hmm. the Trisha Yearwoods, people like that, the Ronstadt influence particularly, and to a lesser mm-hmm. extent, the influence of Olivia, of Olivia Newton John as well. Okay, so really, if you've had a sizable number of hits, we should assume that you've been an influence anyway. Right. I mean, Herman's Hermits actually did have a certain amount of influence because unlike a lot of the kind of, if you want to call them boy bands of that time, they actually were a band. You know, mm-hmm. that they actually, that the other, that the other members of the group actually were respected musicians. And that they, they did have a, you know, at least a certain amount of influence on kind of the, your basic pop rock of, of later years. And, and that's really apparent in that new, uh, Bear Family reissue mm-hmm. of, uh, Hermits Hermits. Have you heard that, to Hal? Uh, I haven't heard the, the, the whole thing, no. Okay. I ha- I have it. I'm going to be writing about it. But, uh, it, it, you, it's, there's, I mean, I don't know how many, I don't have it handy, so I can't tell you how many, but I think there's like 60 cuts or something. I mean, there's a lot of deep cuts in there, and they had some quality stuff that, you know, that, that you would not know about, uh, you would not know about, uh, sure. especially in the lousy mixes, you know, on those original albums. Those, uh, albums were mixed horribly. Yeah. And, uh, these sound much better. You know, and I mean, they were, they were one of the first bands to cover Ray Davies. Right. You know, mm-hmm. this whole, the, this is a, um, a fascinating debate, and I feel like the qualifications to get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame need to be a combination of influence, hit singles, genre you performed in, mm-hmm. and the era that you performed in. Now, if you did like Herman's Hermits have a massive amount of hits, and I don't, I didn't realize until just now, how many hits Herman's Hermits had, yeah. my initial knee-jerk reaction would be to say, no, they don't belong in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because they really were merely, I would be quick to dismiss them as just a pop group, uh, period, amongst all of these other influential bands to come out of England in the 60s. Uh, but yet when you give me those statistics about how many hits they had, well, then that would kind of push them over the top in my book. Yeah, they may not have been the most influential 
but commercially speaking, they blow so many out of the water, they should get mm. in. Um, okay. You know, another, an, a, another a, a band that comes to mind that I'm a fan of that I always felt gets the short end of the stick when being considered serious artists or Three Dog Night had a very long run of hits yeah. and were very mm-hmm. good at be They may not have written, written their own material, but they were a heck of a band who were great uh, uh, song interpreters who, yeah, they may not have been an influential band. They just may have been a really good American rock and roll band. And look but, at the people that whose songs they were interpreting. Randy right. Newman, Harry Nelson, Paul Williams. Laura Nero. Mm-hmm. Laura Nero. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. You know, they, they had, had such great a taste of hits. nothing else. The commercial success pushes them over the top. Maybe if they didn't have that influential bite that some of the artists had. I'm a huge Lou Reed fan. Mm-hmm. And Lou Reed's influence was massive. If you look at his chart success, he's not a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. He's a solo record. artist. So, um, but that, that, that in Lou Reed's case, the commercial fortunes don't matter. And I think that in the case of maybe a Herman's Hermits, the influence is less important when you're looking at the accomplishments commercially. That gets Herman's Hermits in. Couple what Ringo has done as an influence with the fact that he had a sizable amount of commercial success. Yes. Ringo should have been in as a performer years mm-hmm. ago, period. Yeah. Uh, and the sad thing is, is that if Paul McCartney hadn't done some arm twisting here, yeah. you know, he, he probably would not be in. I mean, every single year since George was inducted, I've been waiting. And um, I, I personally think that he's he's like the Rodney Dangerfield of rock. Yeah. He really does not get the respect that he deserves. I think over time, more and more people are recognizing his great contributions as a drummer. But not enough attention is given to those sizable hits that he had in the 70s. And, you know, we live in a time when sometimes you hear that, that phrase of, whether certain music has aged well, which is something I know that Al likes to use <laughs> quite a lot. But of those seven top ten hits that Ringo has had, there are two songs that still get very good airplay, sure. which I would I would consider to be bona fide classics. And they would be It Don't Come Easy mm-hmm. and Photograph. Right. I think those are two great, really great mm-hmm. songs. Absolutely. And um, I think that he deserves credit for that, plus the other top tens that he had. Plus, as a performer... He's been a legitimate, you know, touring act for the last 25, 26 years, yeah. selling out almost every show he's done. Yeah. Plus the plus the performing with the Beatles too. So you add all that together, and it's it's pretty amazing. He really, you know, if he was getting in as a Beatle, he's already been in there already. Mm-hmm. He's getting in as Ringo Starr, which to me means as a solo artist. And Paul Paul has said he's in as a solo artist. Yoko has said it. Joe Walsh has said it. Mm-hmm. So that's how he's getting in, although the award itself was, was uh, for musical excellence, right. which I believe, correct me if I'm wrong here, didn't that all start because the E Street Band didn't get in? Uh, well, no. That's This was uh, the, the award that Ringo was given was uh, is a, uh, a different one, which used to be the Sideman Award. With the one uh-huh. they would give to, uh, you know, Al Jackson, uh, from, uh, Booker T and the MGs or other, uh, you know, other what they perceived as sidemen who weren't really performers as such. Right. You know, and then what they did was they upgraded that to musical excellence. Is this uh, the first year of that category? Uh, uh, I think I think it was a couple of years ago that they that they upgraded uh, the sideman thing. In fact, actually, you know, now that I think of it, that may be the. Uh, in fact, yeah, I think it think the actually the year that they upgraded it. That was the year that the not the E Street Band, but the um, Bob Seger, the Silver Bullet Band, the year that the, uh-huh. that, uh, that they got in. Which was the obvious hint that soon the E Street Band would, you know, would be inducted. So it's what used to be a sideman award. So it's so at least technically, it's still, um, you know, he's he's not in as a as a performer. And of course, 
again, the know-nothings in social media continue with all this nonsense about Christ, luckiest man on earth, Pete Best was a better drummer. You know, these are these these morons who basically they're all they know about Ringo is the Beatle cartoons and Yellow Submarine, and that's it. That's all they know. And mm-hmm. so they, are, you know, they do all of this haranguing about, about, you know, he's a, he's, he's, uh, he was just a, a hanger on. He's lucky. Pete Bass was a better drummer. Stuart Sutcliffe should have been in the, in the band and all this nonsense, you know, mm-hmm. and, and unfortunately there are people that pay attention to this nonsense instead of basically letting these people know what idiots they are. <laughs> But see, the, I, but the thing is, I was just going to say to try to continue, continue to try and justify this whole, you know, mess, which is what the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is, is really kind of crazy because it, it really it doesn't mean anything. Well, what they you need know? to do is have some some specific like, for instance, as Darren well knows, the Baseball Hall of Fame, there are certain standards where if you. You know, if you get 3,000 hits, you know, unless there's a suspicion that you've, uh, that, uh, you know, half of those hits were fueled by outside substances. If you get 3,000 hits, you've, you're pretty much a lock for the Baseball Hall of Fame. If you get 500 home runs, if you win, mm-hmm. if you're a pitcher and you win 300 games, you're a lock. Now, it should be the same. There should be a separation between what you would what you might call the the AM hit records era and the FM era of hits and influence but there should be standards that if you get a certain number if you, especially if you're say it's a 60s act if you had a certain number of hit records you should be in Mm-hmm. No, but, and, and get uh, get Jan Winter out of the, the selection. Please. Oh yeah, absolutely, because because <laughs> he you know he really you know he was the man who, who you know was caught with his hand in the ballot box the year that the Dave Clark Five should have gone in, and mm-hmm. you know he manipulated the vote so that one of the rap early rap acts, Grandmaster Flash, got in, and unfortunately, and it it ensured that the following year. Uh, the Dave Clark Five would go in just, you know, on an, under, you know, the embarrassment of that scandal alone. Unfortunately, by the time that happened, two members of the group had, had died. Mm-hmm. Dennis Payton yeah. and Mike Smith, and Mike Smith passed away just a matter of weeks before the group was inducted. Right. And, yeah, that was, that was tragic. Yeah. Was so, so, so absolutely, Jan Wenner should be, uh, ousted. From but from that position, but unfortunately, there's so much politics involved in the in the way the you know well in the way the business in, in the way the record business operates. There always has been, but it also in the way the uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame you know it operates. I mean, there's a, a mid mid 70s studio group that was produced by Bernard Edwards and Nile Rogers called Chic. Who had, a, who had a certain number of hits during the disco era. They had been nominated. They, you know, they've never actually been elected, but they had been nominated every year for I don't know how many years. And the only thing I can, I can uh, attribute that to is that it must, because they recorded for one of the Atlantic subsidiaries, is that Ahmed Erdogan, who was another one of the architects of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it must be in his will. That they be nominated every year. <laughs> That's the only reason. Because okay, you know, if you want to put Nile Rodgers and Bernard Edwards in as a you know as an influence because they were great songwriters and great producers, fine. But this was a studio group, and what they're doing being nominated every single year is is just beyond suspicious. So it's uh, you know it's it, it really is a sham. Uh, but they're winners in the in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Oh yeah, and right. as you know, as, uh, you know, if you if you look at uh, the yes, he has founded Rolling Stone magazine, but there were a lot of other rock and roll magazines, uh, uh, big rock and roll magazines out there. Bomp, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Bomp. Great, great show. Bomp. 
sure. Break Shop. That was a superb magazine. Mm-hmm. That was a fantastic magazine. You'll never see Greg Shaw in the Rock and Roll Hall. No. I yeah, that, Crawdaddy. That's just one. Crawdaddy. Crawdaddy. Is uh, I don't know if Paul Williams. Paul Williams. Mm-hmm. I think the, Paul uh, Williams is dead. Um, I think he, he's he's passed on it. Yeah, he has, and I'm not sure if they if they put him in the uh, you know the non-performer wing or not. I'd have to I'd have to check. But uh, but yeah, the, I mean the fact that Jan Wenner is in there that shows you just how corrupt the whole system is there. It's it, but, and you know mm-hmm. something else I want to bring up. We were talking about how progressive rock and and heavy metal has been snubbed. I think the artists who are more poppier and lighter yes. when it comes to music, they're also frowned Absolutely. upon. Absolutely, Abba. Um, yeah, Abba was, I mean um, was the biggest group in the world in the seventies. And yet they're they're looked on as this uh, as this lightweight pop band that you know grandmothers from Wisconsin boogie to at uh, you know when they go see Mamma Mia on Broadway. Mm-hmm. You know, and would you know Al mm-hmm. off the top of your head? I was just thinking about Patua Clark. Is she in? I don't know. I don't think so. Okay, no. so I don't think so. And no. and she's no, another she's one who had not. she had a top between what sixty four. And the end of 64 and, let's say, somewhere in 68, she had a slew of hits, mm. you know. I'm, pull it, I'm pulling my uh, my copy of uh, Joel Whit- Whitburn uh, back, uh, back mm-hmm. over to my desk um, so I can look it up how many. Oh, but, yes, yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. She had tons and tons and tons. Yeah. And that's just and that's just here. In England, she had an even longer career. And in France. But the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is really based upon the U.S., she, oh, had, she well, had 15 yeah. top 40s. She had 15 top 40s right. mm-hmm. uh, between, uh, between 65 and 68. You know, I can think of a number of acts who had a decent number of hits that are in the same category as some of the, the same people that we're mentioning here. I mean, um, like uh, the Grassroots. Yes. Or, or the Turtles. Yes. Uh, you know, those kind of bands. I'm not sure. Is, are the association in? No. Again. No. Never okay. even nominated, and that, and that's also that's criminal, because okay, so yeah, mm-hmm. these are acts that had a lot of hits, yeah, and I don't understand the logic. I can understand the love and spoonful getting in because they were also an influence. Yes, but if we're going by the same criteria that if you've had a lot of hits, you must be in some way an influence, mm-hmm. then these other artists should be in too. Yeah, no question. Like I said, there should be there there really should be some kind of pretty much strict standards that if you had a certain number, especially for 60s acts, uh, if you had a certain number of hits uh, in on, on the U.S., yeah, pres- presumably the U.S. charts, and not just the England, because then you'd have to put Cliff Richard in or whatever. But it, certainly if you had a certain number of hits in America in the 60s, then you should be auto, you know, an automatic to go in, and then you know, in the seventy, you know, once you get into the seventies and the eighties, it's a little, you know, uh, you know, you could use the combination of perhaps pop hits, but also their influence, uh, the amount of airplay that they got on FM stations, because you know, I mean, Led Zeppelin was not really a pop hit group, you know. Let's face right. it, sure. So, uh, and there were you know other acts. You know, like that, like, like yes, like the Electric mm-hmm. Light Orchestra. Mm. Who yes. Although they had a lot of hits, though. Oh, of course they did. Yeah, I mean, but just based on, I mean, Jeff Lynne, you could make a case that Jeff Lynne should be in there on his own. Mm-hmm. Right, as an influence. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, top three artists not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame who should be for each one of you. <laughs> uh, should I go yeah, first? Yeah, you go ahead. I always say number one, Moody Blues, no doubt about it, because they really started around 64, 65, blues band. Then they became so influential for being, you know, one of the pioneers of progressive rock. I definitely would say yes. You have to put yes in there. If you have Genesis in there, how can you not have yes? Or for that matter, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I'd have to say Chicago, because Chicago had so many hits. And their albums sold tremendously well. The, their right. first few albums were, were double albums or you know, triple albums or what was it? Quadruple. I think their first, first. few were 
first <laughs> okay. Three, the first three were were, were doubles. doubles. The fourth was a quadruple, yeah. mm-hmm. and then the seventh then, was a double. Right. And then if you say Chicago, you also have to put blood, sweat, and tears in there too. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, all right. So those are my your, three. Mine's reverse. So I'll just let. Uh, Steve and, and Algo, because mine in that order are the opposite order. Chicago, yes, Moody Blues. Okay. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely say I'm gonna stick by the Shangri Las. I really think I really think they should be in. Um, yes, I'll, I'll also go with yes. I'm not as strong on the Moody's, although I do believe you know I, I think the Moody's should get in there. But I mean, if we're talking the top three, the Monkeys has to be the third. And Al? Uh, Harry Nelson, absolutely. Chicago, absolutely. And I would, um, among a slew of others, I'll, I'll pick, the, I'll pick ELO. Nice. Okay. Now we have. All worthy. We have a couple of minutes left. So we really should get into the fact that, uh, that Paul McCartney returned to the road last week and, uh, that there are plans for him to, uh, do a few more concerts, uh, especially in the mid Atlantic states, uh, later on this, uh, this spring. Uh, Steve, can you, uh, give us a, a capsule of, uh, uh, of Paul's uh, concerts from last week? His make oh, his oh, make the makeup shows yeah. in, in Japan. Oh well, he did he did he did a bunch of shows in in Japan last week. Uh, the the big news was that he added uh, the hope for the future to the set for the first time, and he he's been you know jiggling around the sets uh, as he usually does. The last show that he did actually this morning, this is uh, the twenty seventh. He uh, brought back uh, listen to what the man said. So. Mm. Yeah, he's been jiggling around the sets. Uh, he plays Budokan next, which is interesting. Um, he's going to do a, a show at the uh, Budokan where the Beatles played. So that's kind of interesting. But, I mean, there, uh, the usual situation with the uh, with the shows where he's been jiggling around the sets. What I was surprised with was, if you remember, guys, back when he was supposed to go through Japan the last, last year, time, when he got he was going to have the robot. He has yeah. not used – the robot has disappeared. They have not brought the robot out anywhere, and I'm, I'm kind of – that's kind of funny. But, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, basically uh, everything, you know, seems to be uh, as usual. Uh, he's been doing his – you know, he's been doing the, the sound checks. Uh, um, this morning he did Honey Hush, Blue Suede Shoes, Flame and Pie, um, don't let the sun catch you crying. Not the Jerry and the Pacemaker song. Right. The, one, the one he I don't know where he got that song. It's a, it, was a, it, was Ray, it was a Ray Charles. Ray Charles in the is that, uh, yeah. is that, is that what in, it is? in the okay. mid mid fifties. Oh okay, boy he he loves that song. He absolutely loves that song because I, I don't think I've ever seen a sound check. I think was, it's probably one of those songs like Celebration and a couple of others that I think I think there's a Linda connection there. Probably yeah. But anyway, so that's basically what's been going on with, with the uh, with the shows. But as far as the uh, the U.S. shows, he is um, there's a couple more shows to be announced. Um, they have they have not um, uh, announced them yet. Um, I reported last week that they were going to do Charlottesville, Virginia, and Columbia, South Carolina, in addition to Philly, which is the one they've already announced. Right, which went on um, sale, uh, goes right. on sale this week. Right. So the other two have, haven't; those others have not been announced yet. Mm-hmm. So, and right. apparently, There's I guess lo- it's I guess it's Charlottesville. Is that the um, John um, John Paul Jones Arena has already put out a, a thing that they've got a big announcement coming. So, mm-hmm. yeah, they're not and no talk about New York City. No, nothing. No, I mean uh, it, the. The information I put out is what it is. There's no, you know, I, there could be at some point. I mean, he did play Irving Plaza, you right. know, on Valentine's Day. But, you know, as far as I, it is what it is. What I put out there is what I, what there was. So there you go. That's that's what it's like to deal with Paul. Everything trickles out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and in a way, we should be really grateful that when Ringo tours, because he tours for a month to six weeks, Almost all the dates are announced all at once. Yes, which uh, is rare. Uh, 
when you compare that to what Paul does, everything is always you hear one, two, three shows at a time, and you take a gamble. Like I did last year, you know, I saw him in Albany. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if he would play any closer to me. I live in Connecticut, but I I made sure I had tickets for Albany, and I lucked out because he didn't play any closer. So, uh, and the year before that, he played at Barclays Center in Brooklyn. So, um, you know, he's usually very good at playing somewhere close to New York. And if Philadelphia happens to be the closest, that might be it, but you never know. But that's the thing. You know, do you wait? And take a gamble and then lose out of the, when the tickets sell out? Or do you buy immediately? And that's part of the problem in, in getting tickets for Paul. Mm-hmm. There is one song I want to bring up yeah. in the set list because not a big shock to any of us, but he's doing Can't Buy Me Love, or at least he did that in the first show. And Can't Buy Me Love is not a song that's been part of his regular set list. Mm-hmm. He did it in 89.90. He did it in the Back in the U.S. tour. But it hasn't been a regular part of the set list. He's done it at special occasions, like the uh, the David Lynch concert, the one that Paul and Ringo were at. He did Can't Buy Me Love. But it's been special occasions when he's done that. So I'm not sure if he's doing it in every show, but it's nice that he brought that back. Whereas the other changes that he's made, going from Magical Mystery Tour to Eight Days a Week, you know, he's been doing that anyway. So, But um, Can't Buy Me Love is, is a little bit of a surprise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, in terms of, of, of the trickling out thing that you were talking about, Ken, it's actually kind of interesting that we actually got the information on three shows at once. That's that in itself, I think, is a pretty much a rarity. And, the, you know, the question, of course, the question like you guys have already been throwing throwing out is, will there be more? My guess is, you know, and, I, and it's just strictly a guess is, yeah, there will be. You know, I don't think it'll only be three. Mm-hmm. But, you know, of course, everybody wants to know where he's going to go. He's already doing, remember, he's already doing uh, the two festivals, the festival in Delaware and Lollapalooza. Right. So, and actually, uh, Lollapalooza is the only show, at least that's been announced, that isn't in that uh, mid-Atlantic uh, uh-huh. quadrant there. Because uh, mm-hmm. So it seems as if it's, uh, he's making a, a deliberate attempt at kind of, you know, getting – you know, getting those, getting those areas, which, uh, you know, I know in the past he's been criticized for, uh, for neglecting the South, for instance, you know, where he, right. had, you know, he hadn't played in Atlanta in quite a while. Um, so, you know, for instance, uh, you know, my friends over at Beatle Fan have, <laughs> have been somewhat unhappy about that. You know, so we can't all be Rick Glover uh, traipsing around the world. Right, as, right. As fans on the <laughs> run, you know. But uh, uh, but it does seem that he's he's doing this particular quadrant plus Lollapalooza and perhaps more. We'll see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll see. I'd be I'd be surprised if he doesn't add more shows. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make sense to do the Lollapalooza tour and not do dates around it. Yeah, just for that one show. <clears throat> yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. Well, I think uh, I think we've pretty much covered all of the current news, unless there's anything that uh, that I've missed that anybody. No, I think I think we've covered it all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All righty. Well, I think uh, I think we've uh, we've pretty much covered it. So uh, this has been another another edition of things we said today, and just want to thank uh, Darren DeVivo for uh, once again for uh, for dropping by and helping out. Thank you very much for the for inviting me. Appreciate it. Great to be here. And I'm sure you'll be back soon. And for and also Alan Cozen, who's in the midst of in the midst of moving to uh, to New England, and hopefully he'll be back with us uh, hopefully next week. And uh, for now, we should probably yes, tell everybody where they can hear us. I was just about to oh, okay. uh, mention that we're on uh, fab4radio.com on Saturday and Sunday. At uh, noon and mid- noon on uh, Saturday and noon and midnight on Sunday, we're on Pure Pop Radio Tuesday nights, um, and we you can find us on our website at uh, Podbean.com, and also on YouTube. We the show streamed on YouTube. And Ken, you can tell everybody where they can contact us. They can contact us at our email address, which is Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. We also have our own Facebook page, and please, by all means, like us. You'll find out all things going on with the show on the Facebook page. And if you could, could I just plug my website? Please. 
which is kenmichaelsradio.com. One new development on my website is that every single week I do a, a trivia question or a Beatle game, and I normally offer our fans one of three prizes to win. It's now been expanded to nine prizes. So uh, it's a combination of books, CDs, or DVDs. So just go to the website every single week, and you could win one of nine prizes. It's pretty amazing. And are your fellow so, uh, partners in uh, Things We Said Today eligible to win these prizes? Uh, but it's <laughs> very, it's very possible. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe under a dubious name. <laughs> right. <laughs> Darren will use Junior Ortiz. <laughs> <laughs> Some obscure Met from the past. Exactly. New York Met. There we go. There we mm. go. And Darren, uh, you, you should remind us of uh, where uh, where, and when you, we can hear you. All right. You can catch me on WFUV. That's at 90.7 FM in the New York City tri-state area or stream WFUV.org worldwide. I'm also on the weekends on our HD2 channel, which we call FUV Music, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., and again, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Saturday and Sunday. And the Facebook page is Darren DeVivo at WFUV Radio, or on WFUV Radio. Okay, that's great. All righty. And this is, uh, this is Al Sussman, and for, uh, for Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci and Alan Cozen, uh, we'll uh, thank you for uh, for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>